Ready? Yep. My guest today is Jason Bach. Jason, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Welcome back to the show. It's Thank been a you. few years. Yes, it has. Two three. I can't remember. It was in Minneapolis somewhere. Yeah, Open Source North. Yeah. Me and Rocky <laughs> doing a You still a go to that conference? Um, I went to it, yeah, the past two years I've done That's a talk it. at it. So It's a bit of a drive for me. <laughs> Just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, you're speaking at VS Live tomorrow, right? Yeah, well, I, yes, I spec, uh, did a talk yesterday with Rocky on cross-platform development and .NET. Uh -huh. And then tomorrow I'm doing two talks, um, one on Visual Studio 2019, and the other one is on .NET Core 3. Okay, so the, the cross-platform stuff was all based on .NET Core 3, I'll bet. Yeah, yep. That's, uh, the, mm -hmm. that's one of the big selling points of yes, yes, .NET just, Core. Is it? Yep. Run it on those crazy cult-like operating systems <laughs> that, that are not Windows. They're no, yeah, they're not Windows. They start with an <laughs> L and they end with an X. Um, <laughs> But it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because um, the consulting company I work for, uh, Magenic, we do, you know, we do work with a lot of uh, clients and it's become increasingly more that they, that they deploy, especially when they go into the cloud, that they're deploying to, to, to Linux. And it's, it's, it's an interesting option. You know, it gives them yeah. more flexibility. So, yeah, the cross-platform and, and with phones and also now with the web, with Blazor, you know, there's, there's lots of capabilities now with .NET. So. All right. And .NET Core 3 is, is new. It, it was released just recently, right? Yeah, at .NET Conf is when the official release happened. When so was that, was, that? that was like a week or two was, ago? Well, that was the online conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, what's new in .NET Core? Uh, there's a lot of things. Um, the, the things I think we can talk a little bit about here, um, one of them is with, surprisingly, is WinForms and WPF, um, which can seem a little odd. But WinForms is still a thing. WinForms is, it's, it's on, you know, I, I think telemetry that Microsoft has said is one of the most popular project types that gets opened in Visual yeah. Studio. Because it was, it may not be created today. Right. It maintained it 10 years ago, yep. but it still works. Yep, and a lot of people have to maintain, you know, we ask people when we do the talks, how many people still have to maintain projects? Yeah. A lot of hands go up. Yeah. So, because .NET Framework uh, 4.8 is going to be the last version of the framework, and .NET Core is getting all these cool um, performance additions and, and features and, and upgrades and all this other stuff, um, with .NET Core 3, now you can actually target the .NET Core runtime with a WinForms or a WPF app. Now this oh, doesn't, nice. it doesn't make it so that they're cross-platform. They oh. still only run on Windows. Okay. Um, but you get a, a faster runtime, less memory allocations, all, all the good stuff with that, so. Hmm. Okay, are you doing any WinForms or WPF? I haven't, in a, well, I haven't in a long time, it, you know, in part with clients, you know, a lot of clients have moved to web or mobile, um, but also just with my own stuff, I, I kind of stopped doing it because of that, but also because there wasn't a lot of life left to it. And with this, it's not that I would necessarily see a resurgence, but it does give some extension of life to these yeah, projects. I think it's know. a reassurance to these people that are these companies that are, uh, you know, they've invested so heavily in this application. Yeah. And now, of course, you know, 10 years later, it's a huge application. They're running an entire business on it. Yes. If, ex if, if we're suddenly that were to uh, not be supported anymore. Right. That's 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 a major decision. Do we rewrite this application in a new framework, or do we, uh, you know, go unsupported or what? That's that's comfort for them, I think. Yeah. So so I think that's um, one of the biggest features that's there. There's there's two others we can talk about. Um, another one is something called gRPC, which what is that? um, that's. Grand Rapids. <laughs> um, uh, Google RPC, I think, is what you can basically think of it oh, as. RPC, Remote Procedure Call. Exactly. No, <laughs> yeah. You phrase it that way. Um, so if you think of WCF or even remoting, it's it's somewhat akin to that. Okay. It's somewhat the, the same same idea, except, well, one, it comes from Google. Uh -huh. um, so, again, this, I think, shows the um, the openness that Microsoft has is in terms of, hey, there's there's this thing out there. People seem to really like it. Well, instead of us continue, you know, or just instead of us doing our own thing yeah. or creating our own thing, well, why don't we try to embrace that and make that work well also in like TypeScript, .NET. Script, why not? Uh, right, yeah, exactly. Yes. So, because Google used TypeScript for Angular, right. so now it's almost like, well, now there's gRPC uh -huh. support in .NET. So you create these things called protofiles, which right. stands for protocol buffers. Okay. 
So if you, you use their definition, their syntax, and you create this file. Is that a like a JSON file or an uh, file? Not really, no. It's a it's, proprietary it's, format? Yeah, it's just a text file. Okay. And it just defines like what your messages are, what your services are, the methods in them, and so on. Okay. okay. Um, that sounds like WCF, like yeah, the XML pretty, file. Yep. So you create that, and then in .NET, there are generators that will generate the server side stuff for you and also the client side stuff for you. Hmm, okay. But what's interesting about gRPC is that there's a, um, a lot of converters for other languages. So conceivably, you could create a proto file. I could write my service in .NET, and somebody could call it in Java or Ruby or you know any of the, these other languages that have these generators for them as well. So hmm. it, it, it's it's interesting because it's a it's a very fast format. It's meant okay. to be um, very performant on the wire and everything else. But it also has this cross-platform capability, so that's pretty interesting. Okay. Yeah. So th I, I, you said that uh, that reminds me of what HTTP does, which is that it can expose something as a web service because everybody speaks HTTP. Right. Every platform can speak that. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that uh, I guess not every platform can speak it, but there are adapters, or there are some connectors or something like that. Yeah, is I mean, I, 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 I use the word generators because they. These tools will look at the proto file and then they'll generate the code that's necessary for that language. Oh, okay, so they'll generate that uh, Python code or Java yep. code or Ruby code, whatever. Yeah. Whatever it takes, or C sharp code. Yep, exactly. Okay. So, or I guess Go code would be good to Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so that's another. Right. Um, I'm just trying to get my head around because I'm not, not familiar with this. <laughs> I hadn't heard of it before. Yeah. Um, so, that's another feature. And then one other one we can talk about is Blazor. Uh -huh. um, so, Blazor was this kind of experimental project for a while where they were looking at, can we get C-sharp code to run in a browser on top of WebAssembly, okay? mm -hmm. which is really cool. It's a, it's a really great great idea, and it's been you know, awesome to see this framework evolve Why over the last cool? year. What's, what's, because what's I can now, um, you know, when we talk about cross-platform, cross where we said Linux, but then you can also talk about phones, that I can make C-sharp code run on an iPhone or an Android with like Xamarin. But the web has traditionally always been JavaScript. Right. And now with WebAssembly in the picture, there are more and more languages that are targeting WebAssembly as an output. Hmm. So then you can build web applications in languages other than just pure JavaScript. Okay, I see. Um, and so what Blazor is, is just, you can kind of think of it as like the .NET way of doing it. Um, so it's, it uses Razor syntax, but Everything is done on the client. Um, I, I do have to put a caveat there in a moment, but that that's the the cool thing about Blazor is that it's it's the idea is to say we can now start building web applications and do it all in I'm sorry, do it all in C sharp. Okay. Yeah. So so with .NET Core three, what got released um, is something called Blazor server side. Um, to make a really long story short. Essentially, what Blazor server side is, is it's the same syntax, your components are the same, everything is the same. It's just what they call the rendering aspect of Blazor happens server side. And there's this little signal R channel that happens between the client and the server. Oh. So if you like click on a button that's supposed to call some C sharp code, it actually gets routed over the server, done there, and it's brought back. And all like the page rendering is done server side. So the Blazor client side stuff is coming in April or May of next year. So that still needs some work, in part because WebAssembly is so new, there's still okay. you know, optimizations and all this other stuff. But the actual model and approach that Blazor is now defined and supports in .NET Core 3 is gonna be the exact same thing for the client-side stuff. There will be no difference in your code, which is a good thing. Okay, so. this is another thing I have to get my head around a little bit. So. Uh, I know so there's client-side code. Mm -hmm. We used to write it in JavaScript, and now if, if this takes off, we'll be writing it in C-sharp. But the browser doesn't understand C-sharp, so there's some sort of compilation yeah. that turns it into uh, WebAssembly. Right. Well, so what happens with Blazor is they they use um, a version of Mono's runtime. Okay. And that's actually the WebAssembly component that it basically starts everything off. Okay. So if you create a, Bla a Blazor client-side app and you look at your network traffic, you'll start to see a file come down called mono.wasm. Okay. It's just the runtime targeted for WebAssembly. And then that, you'll see what follows after it, is all of your assemblies, like the ones that Mono needs and then also the ones that are from your project. Okay. So 
that just essentially runs your assemblies just like you know .NET does anywhere else. Got from it. So that these point are compiled on. mono assemblies, and that mono uh, runtime engine is in the browser, and WebAssembly hooks into that. Mostly, yeah. I mean, okay. it, the, that, that's good enough. I mean, that, that's okay. that's pretty <laughs> much pretty much what it does. Um, but then the server side code is. Uh, where that's running on a server, and that's just running regular C sharp on a Windows server, or, or running on a it, yeah. If you do yeah, if you do the server side version of Blazor, then all that code is actually running server side. If you do the client side version of Blazor, it's all running client side. Uh. Okay, um, so it, you know the the server side part of it is the reason I think it got released first is because lots of years and history of how do we get C-sharp to execute in a, in a middleware mm -hmm. area? That's been known for a long time. Sure. Um, the only interesting... The first thing I wrote was uh, <laughs> yeah, like C-sharp go in line between those less than percent. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember that. Um, the only little interesting thing is that signal R channel that it sets up that you don't have to do. It's just done automatically for you. So uh, okay. Um, but if you do it client-side, then all the server does is basically just serve up the content and once it's in the browser it's all executing there everything's done in the browser then okay and that's just built into .NET Core. Cool. the the server side part is it yes okay. right. the, the client side part will be coming in about six six months uh, so, so .NET Core 3.1 or something I, i'm not I, sure I, I don't know how they're naming things. yeah i don't know how we're naming things i should say <laughs> but it's a it's a really cool programming model because again it's another area that .NET is going to be extended into right. so that this just another like check off the list of where can .NET go it's now going to be able to go into the browser and execute at native speeds that is exciting there's a lot of people like me that just we're comfortable in C Sharp mm -hmm. we understand yes. yeah we could go and learn another language but mm -hmm. there's that's there's friction there there's a, there's a speed bump for us Why yeah it, it, it can be yes and so um, th there's value in learning many languages yeah. and and but there's also time involved right okay. and if you have to keep switching context there's yeah, potentially not. a penalty there too yeah. so yeah that's that's another um place where we you don't have to do a mind switch and you can potentially stay in, in the same language with mm -hmm. what you're doing and you can share if you're building components too if you need to do some stuff like if you're building a, a, a rest api or a grpc service um, you can use that code through dotnet standard you can just Execute it server side, but if you also want to use a client side, same assembly it will work both sides, really and exciting. and yeah, wow. that will that will just work. So that's quite a bit uh, in the newest release of .NET Core. Are there any other features that the, there are some? Um, there's with the the along with the WinForm. Well, it's not with WinForms and WPF. That's probably where it's going to be used a lot. Is mm -hmm. you can now um, package a, basically a single file executable. So when you've built .NET Core apps, one of the things that was a little jarring for me is that you actually don't get an EXE. You get something that is like a DLL that acts like an EXE, and, and then you have all these other files. Right. Um, now in .NET Core 3, you have the option to say, I want to basically publish one executable. That's it. Oh, uh, it makes the distribution a little easier. Right, and, and it actually puts in the version of .NET Core into that assembly. So, I mean, so in the, into that EXE. So it has everything. So... The EXE is bigger, as you can imagine, but if you want to target a particular environment and you want to say to them, it doesn't even matter if you have a, a, a .NET Core SDK installed on your machine or not, um, just double click on an executable. The first time it takes a little bit to run because it has to unpack and do all right. the stuff it needs to do. But then once that's there, it just works, and then after that, it you know from what I've seen, it tends to be a little bit quicker. So, so is it just a self-extracting executable with all the old files inside there? That pretty much, okay. yeah, okay. yep. And again, for WinForms developers, WPF developers, this will be something that they'll probably want to look at, because mm -hmm. um, in some ways, you know, if you remember, click once that right. that was fun <laughs> you know it could it would have worked it was fun yeah yeah <laughs> um this makes potentially the deployment of those applications far easier because you can right. just say here's one file yeah. um but this would also work for other like if you're just doing a console app um that's in .NET core well then you could create potentially a single file exe for linux or for mac you know and then distribute it that way if you like that's really so, nice. yeah yep 
So, so, so there's a bunch of other features, but I think those, to me, those are the ones that are kind of grabbing my attention because mm-hmm. I think um, they, 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 again, they just increase where .NET and C Sharp can go in terms of execution environments. That's exciting. And you're, you're speaking about this, I know, tomorrow in Chicago. Are you mm-hmm. going elsewhere? Um, there, I will be redoing, you know, I've done these talks, you know, here, there, and everywhere throughout yeah. this year at VS Live. Every year uh, I've been doing that. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, also at VS Live Orlando, I'm going to be doing some of these talks uh-huh. as well. Um, so, but for me, speaking is actually this year winding down. I'm going to, you know, after this, Orlando's the last one, and then I'm done for the uh, year. Then you got to spend time with your family. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I appreciate you taking time. Today. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for, for having me. I appreciate it. You can make a lot of friends with technology.